my name is John Muxy. John Llewellyn Muxy. Um, now, um, Llewellyn is a Welsh name, and my family have very strong Welsh heritage. And uh, I used to be John Muxy, and then I went to, when I lived in Malibu, I went to a numerologist who said, if you used the name Llewellyn in the middle, you'd be much more successful. So I did indeed, once I got over here to America, I did put Llewellyn back into my name. So I became John Llewellyn Moxie. My first few jobs in America, though, I was John Moxie. Anyway, I was John Moxie when I made Horror Hotel, which uh, was the first feature film that I ever made. Uh, yeah, the first, I'd done directing, the BBC, um, live plays and things, but I hadn't, and I'd made some other shorter films, but I hadn't done a full length movie feature. And I got a job in rather a strange way. Uh, there was a man called Donald Taylor, who was one of the producers of this picture, and he was making films for the army um, and asked me to direct a couple of them because I had been in World War II and was out of the army. And uh, he liked the way that I moved the actors around within the frame rather than, um, you know, sort of cutting a lot. I don't, didn't like cutting too much, although I had worked in the cutting room and knew about editing, I did like movement, people moving. And uh, he liked very much the films I made for the army and then he said, well, would you like to do this film, Horror Hotel? And yes, I said I would. And I did. And that's how I got that job. My family, um, really, to get into film with my family background was quite hard because my family were involved in the coal business and steel, and we had coaling depots all around the world, and um, we coaled the French fleet and the Italian fleet when they burnt coal to run their engines. And um, my dad was the um, manager of the Buenos Aires, Argentina branch. And when he and my mother got married, nine months afterwards, I got born, but we were, they were in Argentina at the time, so I was born in Argentina and was therefore immediately an Argentine citizen. Um, that happens. If you get born in Argentina, you become an Argentine citizen. That's really uh, the reason that I was born in Argentina, because my mother was there. Secondly, uh, I, she and my dad were always interested in theatre, and um, I suppose I really inherited it from them. I, I wanted to be either an actor or a director or something, and when I was a very young, very young, 10, 11, I remember going on the stage uh, of a British film being made and um, saying to everybody, I'm going to work here one day. And I worked on that very stage as a director some years later. But that's how it all happened. I always wanted to do it and I did it. And I was also a painter, an artist. I liked pictures. So it was a visual thing. People sometimes ask me about horror films. I think that the thing I like about horror films is that, from my point of view, what I like to see in a horror film is not too much. In other words, what the audience doesn't see is more horrific very often than anything that the director can show them. And I think, you know, films have become so graphic now, there's nothing left of the imagination. I think when you read a book, you make your own film in your head. And I think that once upon a time, People who made horror films, which I've always admired, did the same thing. They left some of it for the audience to imagine and not show them graphically each head being pulled off by the monster. You know? I mean, they, they let, it, let the audience do some work, which I think was a very good idea. And I tried to do that in the horror films that I have made. You know, another thing you have to think about when making horror films is the ambience, the ambience of it. Um, I think that elements are a big thing. Fire, water, mist, rain, all those things 
act well in a horror film or work well for you. In this, in the Horror Hotel, which was my first, I got caught up with mist because I thought that would be interesting and we used a lot of fog in the picture, which uh, was difficult, but it was worth the effect. I think it added an ambience to the picture. I did a horror picture later on with Barbara Stanwyck and uh, we were wondering how to introduce the ghosts into the house without actually seeing the ghosts. And I said, wind. There'll be wind. So we got a wind machine, right? A big, huge wind machine with a propeller. And we started that up and it blew the ceiling off the set, blew all the, all the props over. But anyway, we started there, then we cut the speed down. But the wind actually became, with the right sound, the wind became really scary because you couldn't see anything, but you knew there was something there. And that's what we did. Uh, that's what I think is important with ambience. You've got to find something which is somewhat intangible, but yet it adds a feeling to the picture. As a fledgling director, uh, I didn't really get involved too much in the development of the script. I was given the script, which I gratefully accepted, and then I did some little bit of work on it. I had some ideas about visuals. I didn't, talk, I didn't worry too much about the dialogue at that stage in my career. I was really more interested in the ambience or the look of the picture. And I did some things with it that uh, weren't in the script originally. I mean, we put them in to uh, what I wanted to do visually with the picture. So that's... Uh, what happened then? People have said to me sometimes, did Psycho influ you know, influence you at all with um, Horror Hotel because the plots are somewhat similar? The heroine gets killed off early in the picture. And I point out that actually our film, City of the Dead, came before Psycho. So I wasn't influenced by Psycho because I hadn't seen it. But uh, I do agree, there, is this, there, is, there are some similarities in the way the pictures are put together. I was lucky that I had two, three good, I had Mr. Rosenberg, Mr. Subotsky, and Donald Taylor, who were all the producers on the film, and I must say they were all very supportive. There was this first time movie director, so to speak, and uh, with a fairly big budget. And uh, they backed me all the way, and I had a great time making the picture. People have said, uh, when you make those sort of films, you know, did you think about Hammer? Hammer was a company in England that turned out horror films, spooky films, vampires and thrillers. And uh, to tell you the truth, when I directed um, City of the Dead, I hadn't seen a Hammer film. I knew about them and I knew what sort of films they made, but I hadn't really seen one. So people said, you know, did Hammer, the Hammer films influence your style on it? I can honestly say no, because I, I had not seen a Hammer film before I directed uh, City of the Dead. Casting the picture was interesting. I had a lot of help and, uh, from Donald Taylor, and I had some ideas myself about, of course, about doing it. One of the interesting things about casting the film was to put Christopher Lee, who usually, you know, plays a sort of fearsome character, to start him off in the picture as the kindly, friendly, nice professor at the college. Uh, and then, of course, he becomes what Christopher Lee is known for, which is a bit of a monster. Um, but. Yeah, that was, that was a, a twist which I liked in the script, that we did cast Christopher uh, with that in mind, that people would be a bit surprised when they s saw him being so friendly, and then gradually he turns into something else. Another good thing about the cast really was that they all worked very well together. Peter St. John, Christopher Lee, Felicia Stevenson, Valentine Dial, everybody in that film, it was, everybody wanted to help me, which was very nice, and they all did their best. And I think that uh, 
was something which shows in the movie. It's an ensemble piece. Everybody is trying to make it the best they can. And uh, if I have any knack, I have, any, I have a knack of getting people to work together, and uh, that worked in this film. They all worked together, and they all seemed to like me and tried to make it the best they could. Nisha Stevenson uh, was an interesting casting because she was an American, and we were trying to obviously interest the American market in the movie. And therefore, we did use Venetia Stevenson, and we did use Dennis Lotus, who hadn't done very much, uh, and Christopher Lee, of course, we know about. But Venetia Stevenson was an American lady, a lady who was up and coming in the movie business. And uh, she brought an innocence and a sort of that blonde, lovely look uh, to the picture, the innocent blonde lady who gets caught up in this devilish witchcraft. And from that point of view, she added a lot to the production. The other lady in the film was, uh, apart from P Patricia Jessel, who played the witch, the other young lady in the part was Better St. John, who uh, was a very sort of down-to-earth lady. And uh, <clears throat> she brought a balance to, uh, we had three, three different ladies. We had Venetia Stevenson, who was the blonde innocent who gets killed. We had Patricia Jessel, who was the evil witch. And we had Better St. John, who was like sort of the more leveling lady in the picture. She gave us, um, she, she, she brought sort of, she was about the only woman who was sane in the picture, I think, and she was, she was, uh, she did bring that quality to it. She also provided a little love interest, uh, which was always helpful. One of the people I really liked in the film was Norman McCowan. McCowan. He plays the blind priest. Playing blind is not easy for any actor. And uh, he has a wonderful face. And he was like the voice of doom, you know, get out before they get you. I mean, that was his job in the film, and he did it very well. He was um, interesting, exciting, real, and as I say, he had a great face. So that was a help. City of the Dead wasn't a big budget picture, and uh, I'd been doing television plays where you get three weeks of rehearsal, you know, with the actors before you even put the play in front of the cameras um, when we were doing live steam television. Um, and uh, I think what I found was that although I didn't have that three weeks of rehearsing like it would a play in a theatre, I, mean, uh, I did find that the times, because they were all such good actors, I was blessed. The times that we spent rehearsing, a lot of good things came out, a lot of ideas came to forward, and uh, I think we, we, we made the film was really put together during the rehearsals. City of the Dead wasn't the only film I made with Christopher Lee. I then went on to another one, and we made a uh, film called The Circus of Fear. It was also made by a German company, but uh, that was sort of good because we were working in the winter quarters of a circus, Billy Smart Circus in England. And we had real live animals and we had uh, people having to react with these live animals. I will say one thing. We had two great moments. One was we had some people fighting in the ring, some men got into a fight, and the elephants were in the ring at that time, and they didn't like it. And we had a, f a very nasty moment when the elephants got very upset and started to charge about. And the other thing was that I wanted to get a shot in a lion cage with the actor with the, with the actor's hands or the chair in the foreground, the whip or something. And uh, nobody wanted to do it. So I said, well, give me the camera and I'll do it. And I did actually do it. Yeah, I, would, I did it. Um, and the, the fascinating thing was that the lion tamer was really quite scared of the lions. 
But it, nothing happened. I mean, I was still here, and I wasn't torn to bits. But there, it was interesting working with live animals. Elephants, you had to be careful of. Bears, very careful of. And lions and tigers, you treat with great respect. I've done both television films, and I've done some feature films. Um, television films are much quicker because there's less budget, and uh, you have to make them quickly. Um, we started off, you know, making television films in 12 days. In the early days with Aaron Spelling, when we first started Movie of the Week, we made them in 12 days. And now, I mean, now we do them in five, six weeks. But um, at that time, yeah, it was tough because you had to think fast, rehearse fast, and shoot fast, and print quickly. John, people have said, you're a mysterious fellow. You seem to like doing horror and mystery films. Well, I do. I think because I have a feeling that in that genre of picture, the horror film, the mystery film, the director has a chance to let the audience's imagination work for them. And I think that is why I'm interested in that. I, I, I don't want to give... I don't want people to be spoon-fed too much. I'd like them to, the audience, to take a part in it, and have a thought, well, what, what's behind the door? Who's around the corner? The most <laughs> difficult scenes to direct are scenes when people take their clothes off and start making love to each other. That's always embarrassing. I mean, it's very poor old actors, embarrassed, and uh, you have to clear the set, and that's the most difficult. Yeah, love scenes, particularly, more explicit love scenes are they're 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 difficult, yes. Because although actors sometimes pretend they don't find I don't care that much. But you know, deep down they do. And you have to be very gentle, very father figure, and lead them through it so that they don't feel upset and they don't feel embarrassed. And you clear the set. You don't have too many people watching. Those are the most difficult scenes to do, I think. When I uh, had made a few films over here, and um, I worked with Aaron Spelling and did some early movies of the week, they approached me to do The Night Stalker, which a man called Dan Curtis produced, and he actually found this script. It was a book. And uh, the script was dreadful. But we read the book, and then we went back to the book, rewrote the script, and made The Night Stalker that way. I mean, it came out of conglomeration of us all getting together and putting the script right. People like Rod Serling came into it, and Dan and I wrote some. And, uh, I mean, when you think about it, a vampire in Las Vegas, I mean, you know, you can't lose, really. It, it worked very well. It was, it, uh, was something that uh, intrigued me very much. In England, we had a series of films made under the banner of a writer called Edgar Wallace, who um, was a mystery writer, a British mystery writer. And uh, there was an Edgar Wallace sort of theatre, and I made a, quite a lot of those films. Uh, it has been rumoured that Circus of Fear became, was a German Edgar Wallace film. I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, I, I haven't. I know it was released with a German, it was dubbed into German. Um, people spoke German. And of course we had Klaus Kinski, who's a wonderful German actor, as I probably know. He was in it, and uh, I'm sure he revoiced himself. But uh, I don't remember it being touted when I made it as it was going to be a German Edgar Wallace film. I've been lucky enough to work on both sides of the Atlantic making television films and series in Britain and here in America. The interesting thing was that in Britain, I only learned this after I came to America, in Britain people used to come to America, like producers would come to America and stay on the set watching a television film being made for about 10 minutes and then come back and tell us how to make it. Uh, 
And it was always wrong. I mean, the, the, the ideas they had, they half got what the Americans were doing, but they hadn't really got the full process. So when we tried to copy what the American, we thought the Americans did, it really was not very successful. So, and I'm talking about technique of lighting and, you know, uh, building and lighting and shooting a scene, not the acting, um, in order to get through the day's work quickly. Uh, they thought the Americans did that very well. When I came to America, there were, Americans did have a wonderful process of making television series, make them in seven days, and uh, that was, that was uh, because they had indeed evolved a very efficient way of doing it. But in Britain, it was slightly different. They, we, we made them quickly, but when we stuck to our own methods of making them, it was more successful than when we tried to copy what we thought was the American way. The sort of thing that I would like to look for in a, in a visually is like in the film City of the Dead, Nan Bart of Venetia walks across the village square at night and she passes two people and they stop behind her and they turn. She senses them stopping and she looks around and there they are looking at her. She walks along, another two people pass her and they stop and stare at her. Then a single man stops and stares at her. And then she goes to the church. And I thought it had a sort of a pattern, had a great, it was a wonderful show when this sort of depth of people in the fog. And uh, in the f story, her brother, who later in the picture, comes to do the visit the town where his sister has disappeared. And he also walks across the square. And I thought, I'll repeat that trick with the same people. And what, it had a sort of deja vu thing. It had a, it had a, it had a, I thought a nice look to it, and it was a, a repeat of something. And uh, it was mysterious. Why were they in the same thing? Made people think. Version. City of the Dead made quite a splash at its, at its time. It was a very, it was a picture of full of, um, or good acting, thank God. It was quite interestingly shot. Um, it was wonderfully lit by a, a superb cameraman, Desmond Dickinson, who started his career in the 1930s and uh, did Hamlet with, with Sir Lance Olivier. And I mean, he was one of the great pioneers of British cinematography. And I was lucky enough to be given him as my cinematographer. And together, we worked on this look, which we went for in the picture, which was the mist, which was um, paraffin spray, new job, we called it. And you heat it up to a certain temperature, and you fire it out of a gun, and it layers like smoke. Depending on how hot you make it, is depending how high the layers lay in the cold stage. And, uh, the trouble with it was that it was paraffin. And if you breathe a lot of paraffin, you have to go to the bathroom quite a bit. That was the only snag with it. We did lose a bit of time where people got affected by the paraffin. But on the other hand, it did give Dickinson, Des Desmond and I a look which we liked. We didn't just want, you know, fog on the floor, which you often see in films and people walk through it, it swirls about. We wanted it up in the air so that it it, the film, in that point of view, had a, had a different look. Um, that was, that was, a, that was, we talked about, we've talked about what do I, I have a twisted mind, I suppose. I, I like that sort of creepiness in horror films. Try to do it in most of the ones I've made. I'm very pleased that somebody has put this film back to what it was and given it its correct title. Uh, Horror Hotel was a title given to it. Um, I'm not quite sure why. I didn't like the title, but I had no control over it. Certain footage was removed for the American market, uh, which I, of course, had no control over. But I hope that those of you have, who have seen Horror Hotel and now maybe will see 
City of the Dead will see that it is a better picture with the old footage put back. I'm happy to say that after all this work we all did, that on the whole it got very good reviews. Uh, it was well received in England and it uh, didn't win me an Oscar, but didn't win any of us an Oscar, but it, it was well received for the genre of film it was, for a low budget horror film. It was stood above a lot of others, believe me. And uh, I'm very proud of that, and I'm very proud of having worked with those people, and I'm very proud of having made that picture, and the fact that um, it's still around today, and people are still interested enough to ask me to come and talk about it, and uh, to share with you my feelings for the film. In closing, I'd just like to say uh, how grateful that I am, and we all are, for you buying this film and looking at it, and I know that we all hope that you really enjoy it. It was made with love, and it was made with care, and uh, it was my first shot, so I'm, I'm proud of it. Thank you. I believe the way that I was uh, picked for the part was I had moved from Hollywood to London and I was on a weekly uh, panel show called Jukebox Jury once a week and I was the American girl <laughs> and I think well, the producer saw me on, on television and uh, they were looking for a young American actress and that's how I got the, the job. The only thing I think I brought to the movie really was an American accent. <laughs> and a certain amount of youth. They were looking for a young American girl in London, and I guess it kind of narrowed, the, narrowed it down a bit. Does that sign say Wamport Road? Wamport Road, yes. Oh, good, I was afraid I missed it. Is it uh, white wood you seek? Yes. I too. Uh, would I be imposing if... No, of course not. Get in. Thank you. The two things I remember most about um, the movie is, first of all, the, the amount of fog there was. Uh, they took over the largest stage in Shepard and Studios and just filled it with fog all the time. <laughs> As I remember, it was very cold in the, in the set. I think they had to keep it very cold to keep the fog down on the ground. But it was, it was a lot of fog. <laughs> the second thing I remember most about that movie was very long day I had having to scream and you think it might be easy to scream <laughs> but it's very hard because nobody ever really screams at the top of their lungs and screams so so continually but when I was being stabbed by the coven of witches I had to scream like for a whole day and that was I'll never forget that part <laughs> that was one of the hardest acting jobs it probably my part was probably filmed in sequence because I they didn't carry me through the whole picture. Uh, I think we did the exteriors first, and then a couple of the interiors, the my death scene and the, the um, opening where I'm talking to my boyfriend and, and uh, Christopher Lee. But I, th I don't remember uh, being kept for the whole picture. I think they, they got rid of me first, <laughs> like they did in the movie. <laughs> Selwyn. Oh, no! Eleven. Oh, no! Let go of me! Let 
Well, you know, to be honest, I didn't know um, who Christopher Lee was until right after I did the movie, my American friends told me that he was like the, Ameri the British counterpoint to Vincent Price. And at that time, he wasn't an international star like he is today. So I wasn't aware of him. He seemed like a very nice gentleman, um, good voice. <laughs> And the, I think Dennis Lotus uh, was a singer. He was um, he played my brother. And Betta St. John was a, an American actress, although I thought she was British when we were working together. It was kind of strange because I'm, I was born in England and I moved to America. And I did a, then I went to England to do the movie where I played an American, but actually we filmed it in England. So everybody, <laughs> and I have an American accent, I think, but for some reason it seemed like when I watched the film, I was slightly British in it. Everybody was kind of mid-Atlantic, I think. O oh Lord of Light, accept this sacrifice. I'm really surprised of all the films that I've done. This is the one that most people who are real film buffs know about. And I'm just am amazed how this movie has stood up over many of the other films that I've, I've done. I just saw the film recently, um, the, new, the new cut, or the English cut, and the first thing that I, I noticed was the cinematography. Um, I think it was like way ahead of its time. It was beautifully done. And the the uh, cinematographer was Desmond Dickinson, who's become who went on to become an award-winning cameraman. One interesting thing that people recently have brought up to me is that there is a similarity in the structure of City of the Dead and Psycho. And I I remember that we made s s that movie f b first because I I left London and I went back to Los Angeles and I went. I remember going to a drive-in to see Psycho and being scared to death, but not really realizing that Janet Lee was Nan Barlow <laughs> in it, and the surprise when the so-called heroine is killed after the first third of the movie. Uh, I mean, that was that's just a talking point that people bring up to me, and it's funny. Uh, sometimes you're involved with things and you don't even realize it until later when you know film buffs point these historical facts out to you. I don't know why the movie is held up. Well, it's just a, it's a good movie. I mean, it's beautifully done. It's beautifully photographed and directed, and it's, it is timeless. I actually started modeling at 14. Um, my, my girlfriend and I were at the beach at Malibu, and there was a, uh, quite a famous pinup photographer and his wife who also lived down in Malibu and they saw me and asked me if I would take some some photos for them and um, that started me as a model and I did a lot of covers of magazines at that time the, the photographer was Peter Gowland who's still quite well known for his his glamour shots of women then I did a layout in Esquire magazine just as a model and it was seen by somebody at RKO Studios, and they asked me if I would be under contract. At that time, that was the thing. They found young actors and put them under contract, and they taught me to tap dance and fence and s s do all these things that were never very, uh, it, it didn't come in handy at all. And then the studio actually closed at, after about six months, and I went to Warner Brothers uh, as a contract player. And I did 
some very small walk-ons in their pictures and their television, the, especially the uh, Western television series that they were shooting, uh, like Sugarfoot Maverick, Cult 45, I uh, can't even remember all, Cheyenne, and um, Hawaii, I think it was Hawaii Five-O I did, but that was because I was under contract to Warner Brothers, and they would just come and give me like three pages of dialogue, and had no idea what the story was or anything, and I'd show up and, <laughs> and do it. My first real picture, where I had a part, <laughs> was Darby's Rangers. And that was directed by William Wellman, who is a very well-known director. I, I was thinking about that movie, but the similarity between that and City of the Dead is that that picture was all shot on an interior stage in, at Warner Brothers in Burbank, Darby's Rangers. And they also had fog, not as much fog as we had in the other picture, <laughs> but we had a lot of fog on that set. That was uh, that was my first picture. That contract system was was a wonderful training ground for for new people. I mean, there is nothing today like that. It, uh, the the only thing slightly the same would be working on soap operas, but there's no place where new actors can really get started. No specific place. But that was a great training ground. All the big studios had a contract system and. They pay you very little, but they, you know, you have the experience of actually doing bit parts or sometimes even more. And they taught you, they gave you, you know, acting lessons, lessons for everything. But it was a great system. I think it died around uh, probably at the beginning of the 60s. I think Universal was the last studio that really had a, a going contract uh, players list. My original idea in going into films was not to be an actress. I never had a, just this overwhelming desire to be an actress. I thought it might be nice to be a movie star, but I really wasn't. What I really wanted to do was to be a writer. Uh, and that was what my father was encouraging me to do. Um, my father was a very successful film director. He, he, we came from London because he was under contract to David Sels o. Selznick. He did. Uh, pictures like Jane Eyre. He was signed by Howard Hughes. He did a lot of film noir pictures. And uh, also he worked for Walt Disney. He did Mary Poppins, Absent Minded Professor, um, The Love Bug, a, a lot of the live action Disney films. But he was a great friend of Alfred Hitchcock. And I think he kind of shared Hitchcock's um, view on actors that, you know, nobody over <laughs> 20 should be an actor. I think that when actors are just props. So uh, my father always wanted me to, to be an, a writer or be something else other than an actress in films, which I ended up doing. My mother's uh, stage name is Anna Lee, and she started in films in England. In fact, my father directed um, her in a film, and that's how they met. And when they came uh, to America, one of the first films she did was a horror film. I guess it would be called a horror film called Bedlam with Boris Karloff. She did actually two pictures with Boris Karloff. The first one was not a horror film. Um, and she's now 88, 89 years old, and she's still appearing on General Hospital as Lila Quartermain. <laughs> so she's had a very good, long career. But it has, it's had some, you know, ups and downs, but right now she's, she's uh, as happy as anything. Uh, I remember being on the set of um, Bedlam, uh, which was an early film. I remember being on the set of Mary Poppins. I remember being on the set of, at RKO, when my father was doing the film noir picture with Ava Gardner and Robert Mitchum. I remember meeting all these people, but you know, if you grow up in this, it's nothing, it's nothing special. You know, you just remember it. Hitch was a good friend of my father's. Um, they socialized. They were both uh, English. And they, so they came from the same backgrounds. But uh, Hitchcock didn't direct the Alfred Hitchcock Presents that I did. Uh, the one that I did was directed by Stuart Rosenberg, who 
became a fairly successful director in his own right. My, uh, my father had directed a lot of the early episodes of um, Albert Hitchcock Presents, but not the years that I did it. I really was never that satisfied being an actress. It wasn't a burning passion, and you really have to have a burning passion and a very large ego to be an actor, <laughs> because you get rejected a great deal. And uh, in 1961, I met uh, somebody that I fell in love with and didn't want me to work anymore. So, and I wanted to have babies, so that's what I did. I, I stopped working. I had three children <coughs> in eight years, and uh, I'm really glad I did. When my husband and I uh, broke up, I was looking for something to do to work. Um, and I didn't want to go back to acting, I, but the only thing I knew was the movie business. So I decided that um, I would go to work for somebody as like a, a reader, which is somebody that reads scripts and makes, um, does synopsis on the story. I did that, and that turned into a story editor position. And then I got a job um, at a private f uh, film production company that had raised a lot of money to finance films. And I became the vice president of production at that company. And one of my jobs was to act as the executive in charge of production on the films that they financed to kind of keep track of the production for my company. The company was called Cinema Group. It was um, funded by Merrill Lynch. They did a private placement and raised a lot of money. And um, the first film we did was Take This Job and Shove It, <laughs> where, uh, where I, I went to um, Iowa, where it was shot, and spent the whole shoot out there. The second picture, uh, right from Iowa, I went to um, Louisiana, on the border between Louis Louisiana and Texas, where we made a picture called Southern Comfort. Uh, that was one of my favorite pictures I was involved with was directed by Walter Hill, who's probably my favorite director of all time, or of contemporary times. And it uh, had a group of young actors, Keith Carradine, Powers Booth, um, several others. And it was all shot in a swamp between Louisiana and uh, Texas. It was a fun picture to do. I definitely uh, prefer producing over acting. I was very self-conscious as an actress, and I think it's kind of surprising that I did as many films as I did. I, I really, uh, I, I really like producing a lot better. About five years ago, I uh, was looking for something to do so that I could move out of Los Angeles, and uh, the only thing I really could do, other than become involved in film was uh, computers. So I uh, became a computer database analyst, and I'm a consultant for um, some large companies doing database work. So that afforded me the opportunity to move out of Los Angeles, because I got tired of those earthquakes <laughs> and that traffic. <laughs> I know there are a lot of, of fans of this film, which is amazing, and it, it, I'm really appreciative of it. It's like r being renewed again. In fact, somebody contacted me um, about possibly re remaking this picture. I don't know that, if it will happen, but there, I really want to thank all the fans uh, and the people that are interested in this, because this was made 40-some years ago which is, it's an amazing amount of time to have something that you can look at that's like current today. And I didn't realize at the time when I was making it that it, of all the films, it would be the one that would stand up probably the most, um, certainly the most as an, a, as an actress. 
that I've made. I think that uh, with the advent of DVD is one of the greatest things that's happened to, to films, especially old films, uh, that I can think of. It's brought a whole new audience. I mean, especially for me. I, I go out and rent DVDs and listen to the, the tracks, the, the director's comment tracks and the interview parts, and I think that's, it just gives whole new life to these older movies. And people have come to appreciate them more, I think. And especially with the quality of um, the DVDs now, with this, this film, the cinematography is so crisp and it's so wonderful to see a movie in black and white. That was when I'd, I'd really forgotten because obviously when you're on the set it's all in color. But I'd forgotten that it was a, a black and white movie and somehow it just gave a whole different feeling to, this, to the film. And it was, I can't wait to be able to see it myself on DVD.